several years ago, come into this church. He just come in off the street and he was needing help. And uh, said he needed some gas money. He lived around here, but his family was from down in southern Missouri, down around the boot hill. And if you don't know what that is, just take a, take a look at the map of Missouri. And there's a little boot hill down at the bottom of it. And that's what we call the boot hill. And um, anyway, he uh, needed some gas. And so I don't, I don't give out, people ask for gas, I don't give them money. And uh, we take him down to the gas station and give him some gas and, and uh, <clears throat> witnessed to him a little bit and prayed with him and gave him some, I don't remember what I gave him. Uh, but you just never know how to help somebody. And then about three or four months later, he'd come back by here again and he was crying. I said, what's the matter? He said his daughter had been in a terrible accident. She was over here at the hospital. She was in a coma and she probably wasn't going to live. And I went over there with him and visited with him and counseled with him. Him and his family was there and some brothers that he had and this and that. And tried to, you know, just really witness and minister to him. And um, lo and behold, God healed that teenage daughter of his. And uh, she lived through it. And uh, I talked to him and, and I told him, I said, man, you need to be thankful for what what's going on. And um, just, I don't remember how many times I actually talked to him. but just really tried to witness to him. And then I got a call from one of his brothers saying that he had died in a car accident at night. A tree jumped out in the middle of the front of him while he was going fast down the road. And he was drunk. He had a bad drinking problem. And um, so they asked me to do the funeral. So I did. I went down here at man's funeral home and... and uh, I preached the gospel to them. They, it was sort of a pauper's funeral. They didn't, uh, they didn't have a lot of money. The family didn't have a lot of money. He didn't have any money at all. And uh, <clears throat> put him in, it, it's, I, I don't know how to describe it. It's just a very, very inexpensive coffin. And uh, they scraped up enough money together to dig a hole out at the cemetery and put him down in there. And so I preached the message and talked about Jesus Christ and forgiveness of sins and Turned to God, and I mean, I just told him everything I could think of, and got done. You know how ministers will stand there at the head of the casket, you know, when the funeral's all done, and everybody comes by and, you know, shakes hands and this, and that, and the other, and most everybody walked out. And so I usually just kind of stay around there close by to kind of head the casket out to the hearse. Well, I'm in the back of the chapel, and as soon as everybody's gone, and his buddies knew the coast was clear. One of them went out to the truck and got one of them Playmate coolers, come bringing it in, open it up, and there was bottles of ice down Budweiser in that cooler, and they laid that inside that casket for him. I thought, where he's going, he'll need it, but he ain't going to be able to get it. Amen? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> there's wisdom... And I don't know the, the whole meaning behind it, but there's wisdom when Jesus said, let the dead bury their dead. And uh, <clears throat> I, like to, I like to preach funerals to somebody that I know that's saved. And somebody that I know wouldn't mind me just laying it out. And Gary's done told me. He said, if, if I'm around, you preach my funeral. He said, you let them have it. Okay. Appreciate that. So, if any of us is around when Gary goes on to glory, fasten your seatbelts. Amen. You, listen, and, and, if, and if you want to, you can just tell me in advance, hey, Pastor Mike, if you ever preach my funeral, here's what I want you to tell them, all right? And, and if you're here, part of this church, and you ask me to play Whiskey River over the, the loudspeakers at your funeral... <clears throat> Me and you's going to have a we're going to have a fight. Amen. I've heard the awfulest things at funerals. I ain't going to get into it this morning. I'm going to wait. But I've heard some of the awfulest things. Good morning, guys. Good to see you. Take your Bible. Turn to the book of First Corinthians, if you would. First Corinthians. <clears throat> I like to learn doctrine. One of the things that God has helped me with. Um, 
in this ministry, 1996, um, I had the office of pastor here pretty much dumped in my lap, and I didn't want it then. And um, but anyway, 1997, God just called me into studying Bible prophecy. And I said, okay, I'm going to read the book of Revelation 20 times, the book of Daniel 30 times, because Daniel's harder to understand than Revelation is. And uh, where do you want me to start, Lord? Well, we'll just start reading. And I just started reading and uh, started making notes and drawing, underlining scriptures. And <clears throat> if you look through my Bible, you'll see arrows pointing at verses, and you'll see numbers in the sides there. I'm counting things. Okay? I'm getting wisdom. I'm understanding some things. And in studying prophecy, God has helped me learn doctrine. He's helped me learn issues and, and ideas that are right according to the Scriptures. <clears throat> there are whole denominations that have built themselves. Now, I don't, I, don't mean to, I don't mean for this to sound mean or cruel, okay? But there are entire denominations that have built themselves on the foundation of false understanding of the Scripture. I don't mean it to sound, I don't understand everything, and probably some things that I think rolling around in my head is probably not right, okay? Uh, but let's, let's, get it, let's get it clear first. Number one, the Bible is the final authority on everything, not the doodads running up and down your neck, not your experiences, uh, not the shivers that you get, not some wild thing that, or you saw God, or God appeared to you, or an angel told you this. Or somebody on TV said this. The Bible is the final authority on every doctrinal issue that there is. And if you want to, if you, if you want to, I've had some people do it very nice. I've had a pastor that, that uh, emailed me on a couple occasions and asked me about my position on Christ being a Nazarite. And you know what? He gave me scripture. And I like that. And it wasn't, wasn't personal. And I like that. I don't like to get into fights. I don't like that, okay? If you disagree with me, disagree with me scripturally. Amen. Just here, here's what the Bible says, Pastor Mike. You pray about that and ponder that. Man, I appreciate that. You know what? I have been. I've been pondering what he said, okay? Um, but anyway, so we're going to learn doctrine. And in learning doctrine, when we, when we learn doctrine, we get wisdom out of it. When you get understanding of how God works and what he's doing in your life, it will help you. It'll help you roll with what's going on in this world. It'll help. It'll ease your mind when you lay your head down at night. If you if you know and you believe sound doctrine, and that's the purpose really of, of Sunday school. Especially some people say, well, Sunday school's for kids, and no, Sunday school's for the whole thing. This is we're going to study and we're going to learn something. It's just like job training. Who in here has ever had job training where you had to go and get trained for different things? new things come along? You got to get trained for it. This is no different. Amen. It's no different. And uh, bless her heart, Sister Waymire and Sister Bernice have been sitting back there in practically the same place in Sunday school now for, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 years. Maybe, I don't know, maybe longer than that. And they're not done learning. They don't know everything. Okay? And, uh, but, but, but they want to learn. They want to learn things from Scripture. So that's, that's why we're gathered here this morning. I appreciate you coming. appreciate you watching. And let's get into it this morning. All right? We're going to learn about wheat, and we're going to learn about how God works and how, how it really is, all right? And this will be, and I'm inoculating you, by giving you scriptural teaching, I'm inoculating you against the sicknesses and the diseases that are out there, okay? Because somebody's going to come up with some false idea, and you're going to have scripture that says, no, 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 the Bible says this, and you're going to know that this ain't true. So get ready. Paul... Who wrote this? Paul did. He's called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. Why is Sosthenes' name on here? Why is there somebody else's name on this letter that he wrote to the Corinthian church? Why is that? Because by and large, Paul did not, with his own hand, write much of his letters. Okay? Um, he gives an allusion to, in, in his letters... That he couldn't see very well. Okay? And in one place, I think it's in the book of Galatians, you see how with what large letter I write with my own hand. Okay? He's having to write in big letters so he can see it. Uh, at one point, Paul talked about 
that people would have taken their own eyes out and give it, given it to him so he could see better. And so Paul was, he was, he was receiving these words from the Lord, and he was, he was, he was giving these to someone who was writing this down, and, and he happens to record his name, Sosthenes. And he is a brother, by the way. Paul didn't just hire somebody off the street and say, here, write this down. Can't trust him. Okay? But he's got a brother in Christ that loves the Lord and he loves doctrine and he loves Paul. And he knows that Paul has the office of apostle, which, by the way, is an authoritative office. Paul, even to this day, and the writings that he has are in, still in place in authority in our lives. Okay? Uh, I keep going to Brady here now because Brady's a, he's a businessman. He manages a business, but he's not the one ultimately in charge. Ray Kroc started this thing 60 some odd years ago, and it's still going on. And some of the ideas and principles that Ray Kroc came up with are still in effect in those. Re- and he's dead. OK, but the things that he put down in the business plan that he had is still is still going on. And that authority still exists. And Paul, even though he's dead and gone to be with the Lord, God gave him authority, not just over them, but over us as well. This is the authority that you and I are living under right now. You stay under here. God will protect you. Stay under this authority and God will protect you from what's going on out there from the false doctrine. And then he says under the church of God, which is at Corinth. Uh, to them which are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. I thought only people named Joseph and Mary and Peter were saints. And Ignatius and... No, 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 no. You know who is... Uh, the, the Vatican has got it. To, see, this is where we get doctrine. Vatican's got it all messed up. The Vatican says that we name people to be saints. We declare them by papal enunciation that such and such is a saint. That is not what this Bible says. Saint means sanctified. That's In fact, it tells you here in the verse. You don't need the definition of it. Sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. You know what the word saint means? Sanctified. Okay? It, it means sanctified. It means you have been cleansed and you have been set apart for the will and the purpose and the blessing of God. You've been cleaned. Okay? The word sanctification and saint comes from a, from a Latin word, santa, or sancta, which means holy. Okay? We're supposed to be the holy people. I mean, if you believe, still believe in holiness, say amen. You ought to have some personal holiness about your life. Okay? <clears throat> that means you shouldn't sit up late and watch TV shows you shouldn't ought to watch. Amen? Amen. You shouldn't watch that stuff. You ought to have a holy life. It's not what you do when you're around people. It's when you do what you do when you're in private. Amen? See, nobody's judging you. You just, I'm going to turn you loose and let you judge yourself, all right? But anyway, call to be saints with all that in every place. So now we understand that it's not just to the church at Corinth. With all that in every place, call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So it's all of us. This letter applies to all of us. Verse 3. Grace be unto you in peace. I like that. From God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. Paul was thankful that they were saved, that they had received mercy and grace. And then he says that in everything you are enriched by him, in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Here again, we're going we're to look at another, another doctrinal issue that separates us as born-again, Bible-believing Christians that are sanctified by the Holy Ghost and sanctified by the will of God and called by God, and those of us that were confirmed. Now, if anybody has come, uh, let's say, from a, from a Catholic background or, uh, let's say, a, a Lutheran background or, or whatever, okay? And I learned this when I was in high school because there was a, a young lady that was going to high school with me and uh, she was kind of cute, and I was kind of looking at her, you know, and, and in my mind, I'm going, I hope she's a Christian. And she kind of talked like she went to church a lot, and I'm going, okay, that's, that's number one, okay? And uh, then I found out that she, uh, she was uh, going to this church, and it was a Lutheran church here in town, and she was talking about how she was going to the classes. And so I, I asked her, I said, what classes? She said, confirmation classes. I said, what is that? Well, you take the classes, and then you answer all the questions right, 
And then, then you're a church member. And then you're saved. And I'm going. See, they called that confirmation. Okay? You answer all the questions right. You pass the test. Get baptized or however they do it. And then you're a church member. And now you're saved. And that's really all there is to it. She was counting on that to give her hope of eternal life. Not only is that doctrine incorrect, it's damnable. Because when you convince people that all they have to do is fill out a questionnaire, get some water poured on them, go through a ritual at church, and then they're saved for the rest of their life. When you convince people of that, they will go. Listen, I know human nature. We will go out and live however we want to live and still rely upon what this priest told us. That everything's going to be okay because we went through the ritual at church. That's wicked. We're not. Con- Listen, I cannot confirm your salvation. You might be sitting in this church, amen, in me right now, amen, and lying through your teeth. It's been done before. Lying through your teeth. I cannot confirm your salvation. I cannot say anything to you and say, "Well, you're saved. You're saved. You're saved." That is not my position. The confirmation will come to us by way of the Holy Ghost through the Holy Scriptures. Is that what you believe? Say amen. So look at what he says here. He says in verse 6, or excuse me, yeah, verse 6, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Testimony of Christ. Let's hear your testimony. Let's hear about how you had your sins nailed to the cross. Let's hear about the confession that you made before Almighty God. Let's, as John the Baptist said, let's see the, the fruit of repentance in your life. You know what the fruit of repentance is? Big tears running down your eyes as you're crying and sobbing before the Lord. God, I'm a sinner. That's fruit. Eh? That's a fruit of repentance. You're really sorry. Yeah, and you know this, don't you? You know this as parents. You tell your kids, now, are you sorry? Yes. No, you're not. Okay? And uh, my mom always had a way that if I wasn't sorry, I was fixing to be. I was fixing to be sorry for what I had done. Uh, But anyway, um, a a testimony. Do you have a testimony in your life? Do you have a testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you have a testimony of what God has done in your life? Do you have a testimony of the sins that God has cleaned you up out of? The pit that God took you out of? Don't tell me your testimony about how you passed the questionnaire at the church. And you know, practically, you can pretty much do that online nowadays, I guess, couldn't you? Just get on the computer and chick, click, 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 click. And hit the button and says, now you're saved. I'm not, we're not going to institute that on our website anytime soon, I promise you. Amen. Amen. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift. Now, when we get to, and this will take us a while, so just hang on. I like to, when I go through a book, you all know me, I like to just, especially when they are doctrinal issues, I'll go through the whole Bible. Okay? And uh, we'll just go round and around and around in Scripture and go from one place to another. But we're going to end up dealing with the idea of spiritual gifts, okay, in 1 Corinthians. And I'm not going to be afraid of it. I'm going to tackle the issue. I'm, going to, I'm not going to bring my Baptist upbringing into the, into the conversation. I could care less about being a Baptist or anything like that. I'm not here to defend the Baptist faith. I would consider myself a Baptist in that I believe in I believe in baptism, water baptism. That's where the name comes from, by the way. I believe in water baptism, but it does not save you. And I believe in the foundational principles that are in the Scripture: salvation by grace through faith, and not of works, and the blood atonement, and the virgin birth, and the inerrancy of the Bible. And I mean, those are the fundamentals they call them. But I am not interested in promoting the Baptist faith. And I have detected over the years. People have called our church or asked to talk to me, wanting to know if I'm if I'm endorsing their particular doctrinal statement. And I'll say, well, I just I, I believe the Bible. Here it is right here. And they don't like that because what they're wanting, they're wanting for me to endorse what it is they believe for whatever reason or another. OK, but I'm not interested in what I'm interested in promoting is the doctrines of the scriptures and that alone. OK. And so anyway, that's what I'm interested in promoting. I promoted the free will Baptist most of my life. I can't promote them anymore. 
It's not that I believe their doctrine's all messed up and all this and that. It's just that the free will Baptists are even walking away from the doctrines that they laid down 70 some odd years ago. They're walking away from it. And I'm not. I'm, I'm saying that, you know what, the, you know what the primary thing is? They, they said, we believe that scriptures are present tense, the inerrant word of God. That's what was, that's what's in our current doctrinal statement. Okay? A present tense language. There are no mistakes in the Bible is what they said. They don't believe that anymore. It's not taught in the colleges. I went to two of them. It's not taught there. They, they'll say, now yeah, we're free, but the truth of it is, we believe that there are errors in the Bible. And I don't see how they're getting by with it. Yeah, I mean, I just, I just beyond me, how they're getting by with it. But anyway, um, <clears throat> so I'm interested in teaching the uh, doctrines of the Scripture. And when we get to spiritual gifts, I am going to deal with it scripturally. Okay? I'm not a Pentecostal. I'm not a Charismatic. I'm not anything like that. But I'm going to show you from the Bible what these are. Okay? And uh, so get on board, all right? <clears throat> but he's wanting them to come behind in no gift. And I believe in gifts. And I believe that gifts are unearned. Amen? I believe they are unearned. And um, the Pentecostal persuasion will tell you that the reason why that we're not uh, jumping up and down and speaking in tongues and doing this and that, that like they do in their churches is that we don't believe in it. That is untrue. It's untrue. Okay? I believe what this Bible teaches about tongues, about words of prophecy, about words of wisdom. I'm just going to show it to you. In this, I believe what this Bible says. And I believe that you can and do operate in those gifts. You don't earn them. Okay? How many of you recognize that this Bible is a gift to you? It's been handed down from generation to generation. It's been faithfully preserved by the, by the priesthood of the believer uh, for thousands of years. And it has been given down. And God has given you a gift of this book. Herein lies the gift of healing. Herein lies the word of wisdom. Herein lies the word of prophecy. There is, there, it is a sure word of prophecy. If Jim Samarzis was to come in here, said, Old oh, Pastor Mike, I'm so excited. Man, I can't, get, I can't wait. God told me something last night. I want to get up in front of your church and share it with everybody. Uh, Jim? Can't do it, buddy. I mean, I like Jim. Okay? And I'd, I'd ask him uh, what, what scriptures is on your Oh, no, no, that's not in the Bible. Let me tell you what God told me last night. And uh, uh, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, search the scriptures, see whether these things be true or not. Somebody say amen. And, uh, and so that, that is what I believe. And I, I believe that as a Christian believer, you can, you can have the fullness of the Holy Ghost dwelling inside of you as long as you'll get this book out. When this book is allowed to live and reign inside of your life, you are full of the Holy Ghost. When this book is allowed to rule and reign inside of your life and in your marriage and in your home and in your private life and in your work life and on, you're driving, driving your car uh, to the flea market and everything. When, when this Bible is allowed to reign in your life, you will come behind in no gift. You will come behind in no gift. Okay? So anyway, um, so that you come behind in no gift waiting... For the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's two kinds of people right now that are sitting in churches. Those who are waiting the coming of the Lord and those who are trying to bring it on. You follow what I'm saying? There's a whole massive crowd out there that is trying to hasten, trying to bring on its dominion theology. Uh, they're heavily involved in politics, heavily involved in, in a bunch of stuff going on. Because they're trying to, they're saying that if we can just get enough people saved, we can get enough people in Congress, if we can do this, if we can do that, then we will bring in the kingdom of Christ on this earth. That is not true. We are not the ones bringing it in. He's going, he's going to bring it himself. Amen? You know what he told us to do? He told us to wait. He told us to wait. Now, I'm going to just kind of give you this just for a few minutes. Waiting is, like I say, it's in contradiction to... Doing it yourself, which is you, something you need to understand. Now, I'm just going to give you some practical advice here from someone that's needed a lot of practical advice. Okay? 
I didn't grow up smart. I didn't grow up wise. I've had to have it ground into me like everybody else does. Okay? Biblical wisdom. We talked about that last Sunday. Okay? If you're praying for God to... Uh, let's say that you're praying for God to do something in your workplace. Okay? It's something, really, something really going on at work. And you're really wanting, you're really wanting things better, need something to change or whatever. And you say, God, would you please fix this? You know what the natural inclination of man is? To sit, after we prayed that, to sit and ponder how we can make it better. And what's going to happen if we finally think we've come up with a good idea? We'll probably act on it. What's going to be the end result of that? It's not going to work out too well, is it? It's going to be a big joke. And we're going to sit there in a big pile of rubble and God's going to say, you should have waited on me. Should have waited on me. Okay? And I'm just telling you, if you ask God, if you're asking God to do something at work and you've laid it in God's hands, you know, you know what God expects you to do? Step back. Step back. Let me give you an example of that. If God doesn't send you, don't go. After this deal in Jericho, um, and there was the, when they when the Israelites marched into Jericho, you know the story. Achan found that that garment, and that idol, and that that gold, and all that stuff. He took what God said, "Don't take," and he buried it under his tent. Joshua, just kind of, I guess, going off the high of that victory there in Jericho, and they they marched toward Ai, and Joshua said, "You know what?" We, we done beat Jericho. Ai is going to be easy. You know what he did? He said, why don't, uh, why don't about half of you guys run down in AO in Ai and conquer them, kill everybody, and, and claim it for the Lord Jesus Christ and be back before dinner, and I'm going to be waiting here when you get back. And he sent them down there, and they got their pants whooped. Lost a bunch of uh, soldiers. And they come running back, and Joshua went crying to the, oh, God, what happened? God said, get up. Quit your belly aching. Quit your crying. I didn't send you down there. You went down there presumptuously. You've got sin in your camp. We're going to deal with that before I start blessing you again. And just remember, I've said this before. When you're doing what God told you to do, you don't have to ask God to bless it. It's when you go outside of God's will, that's when you're going to really have to start really getting God to start blessing things. And uh, the thing is, if God tells you, if you're saying, God, I want you to do this, God, do this, God, do this. God is, is expecting you to step back and wait for him to do it. That's called, that's what faith is, by the way, it's trust. You got faith enough to pray it, then you have faith enough to stand back and let God do it. Don't get in his way. Okay? Uh, I, there's even a, a, a supposedly Christian song. Going around in the 80s, I remember it like it was, I kept listening to this song on the radio when I was in Oklahoma, going, man, that don't sound right. It was whenever God closes a door, look for a window. And I'm going, no. If God closes a door, sit down until he opens the door. Talking about spiritual gifts. You know what Jesus told the disciples to do when, when he left? You read book of Acts chapter 1. You want to talk about spiritual gifts, let's talk about spiritual gifts. And I'll tell you how unbiblical they're being done in most churches. When, when, the, when the disciples are there with Jesus in the book of Acts, he told them, wait. You wait. And they sat there and they were together and they prayed they probably had, you know, Bible talks and this, that, and that, but they waited and waited and waited and waited until God said it was time. And then when it was time, did any of those disciples have to usher in the gifts of the spirit? No, they, the Holy Ghost came upon them. They all spoke with these languages as the Holy Ghost gave them utterance and thousands of people were saved all in one day. That was a result of them waiting on the Lord. And I want to tell you something. You know why you won't wait? Because number one, you really don't trust God. And number two, but I think there's something in you that wants the credit for it to begin with. You want to be able to jump in a situation and resolve all the matters and this and that and the other. And then step back and everybody says, boy, thank you. I don't know what we have done without you. Who do you think? Listen, I want to tell you something. You let anybody say that to you. You're in dangerous ground as far as God's concerned. 
You just might as well go spit in God's eye right now because that's what you've done when you dare take glory and credit away from the Lord. This is why I am one million reasons why I'm so much against work salvation and works grace and earning something from God. I am against it. I'm opposed to it. That I am. I listen. God, I've had I've had situations that have come upon me that I wanted to jump in the middle of that I wanted to do myself. And when I did, it was a mess. It was the awfulest thing I've ever made up made of my life that I've ever seen. When I step back and let God do it. That means he gets the glory for it. He gets the credit for it. And if anybody comes to me and says, oh, thank you, I say, ah, I'm like that angel. And when, when the John bowed down to that angel, he said, get up. I ain't taking the credit for this. You go tell God, thank you. Okay? What's going on in this church? You tell God, thank you. It's because of this book, because of the blood, because of the power of Almighty God, what's going on here. Not my Coggart. God could scoop me out of the way and put somebody else here. It's easy. Preachers are a dime a dozen now. Amen. I'm just telling you, you wait, wait for God to do something in your life. Wait for God. You want God, you want God to help your marriage? Don't get in. Don't get in it. Don't get involved. Don't jump in there and say, well, I've got to fix this. I, I don't know where God is. I mean, I prayed. I asked God to do something. How come he's not doing it? I guess I'll have to do it myself. You know how we get, don't you? You have to ask the kids or ask somebody in the house, won't you do that? And they don't do it. And you get mad. I guess I have to do it myself. Can I tell you something? I will tell you how wicked your heart is. That's what you wanted to begin with. You want everybody around you to think that uh, they can't get along without you. It won't be. If, if you don't do it, if I don't do it, it won't be done. That's your attitude and that's your problem right there. This is why the devil's coming in and killing your marriage and he's killing your reputation among everybody, killing your family. This is why the devil is coming in, walking all over the top of you, because you really down deep inside, you want people to think that they can't get along without you. And I'm here to tell you something. I want, if, 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 if you are that way, God will find a way to put you out just to show you and everybody else that no, they don't need you. And I'm going to tell you something, Okay. I, I like what I'm doing. I like preaching this book and I like doing everything that I'm doing here. Okay. But mark it down. God doesn't need Mike Hoggard to do his will on this earth. And the few times that I, I've let that thought creep in. God got his rod out. And chastened me. And said, Mike, I don't need you. You know why I'm using you? Because I love you. Amen? I had a situation with one of my kids one time. I won't say who it was. They were little. And uh, I was just going to spend the day just taking them out doing stuff. And... Uh, as the day wore on, I realized that I, there was no way in the world that I could satisfy their, their lust for whatever it was. I was not making them happy. And every time we'd go do something fun, they'd complain. Every time we'd do this, they'd gripe and moan. But I'll tell you what, I got mad. And I said, you know what? I don't have to do this. I don't have to, take, I don't have to spend a dime on you. I have to feed you and clothe you and give you a house to live in. Other than that, I don't have to be doing this. You know why I was doing it? Because I love, my I love my kids. I want to do things for them. Okay? And something we need to get inside of our heads. God doesn't really need us way, as bad as we think He does. And if you ask God to do something, if you ask God to bless something that's going on in your family, or bless something going on in your church, or bless whatever area of life it is, if you're asking God to bless it, get out of the way. Who is it that shall mount up with eagle's wings? Who is it? They that wait on the Lord. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. That's what the Bible says. And instead of us getting involved and trying our own way, I've just learned this. Instead of us getting involved and trying to get our own way, this and that and the other, why don't you just pray about it and 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 pray about it some more and pray about it some more and then pray about it some more and then just pray until God does something. 
and you step back, and that way God will get all the glory and the praise for what's happened. Can I get an amen out of somebody? I really, I really want you to come, come behind in no gift, okay, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, <clears throat> and I will say this, maybe not so much to you guys here, but a lot of you guys watching, okay, you're the prophecy people. Okay? You're, the, you're the prophecy people. You're the ones that are, oh, you're seeing the Lord in this, and boy, this is going to happen, and, and, I, and I get that. I mean, I'm with you. Okay? Let's be, this, one of the reasons why these people set dates for the coming of the Lord is that they're, they're, trying, to, they're, they're trying to make it happen, I guess. I don't know. Trying to make it happen, and it's self-glorification. God, is, God did not let Harold Camping get anything but a shame face out of this deal. And the same thing is happening with these false teachers all over the place. And there's one, I got mine right now. His name's Ron Reese. And he's predicted the coming of the Lord now three times and failed. Just this year. Okay? God's not going to let these guys get any glory or credit out of it. Can I hear you say amen? That's why he hadn't told us. Amen? That's why he hadn't told us. Anyway. Good to be with you. I want you to study. I'm going to give you some homework. I want you to study the rest of chapter 1. And I want you to see what you get out of that. And I want you to think of why did God call me? Why did God save me? Why did God put me in this church? Why am I, why am I part of, of whatever God's doing? Why is that happening? Okay? Did God, because of my good looks, because I'm a, a snazzy dresser, uh, because uh, I have influence over people, I have, and believe it or not, that's what some people think. But I'm going to show you, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, why God called you. Okay? You study it out and you get the answer ahead of time and let God sink it in. That way you're not mad at me next Sunday. Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear God, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for the beauty of your holiness. Thank you, God, Lord, for helping us. And, Lord, Father, we, we are. we got such a wicked nature, God, <clears throat> that we things going, things going bad all around us and we say, God, you do this now, and then we just jump in the middle of it and ruin it. And, uh, God, I'm not interested in that. And I know how it feels. It's just that, God, I'm just, I've learned and am still learning, God, not to get ahead of you. But I'm just going to stay behind you. And, uh, Lord, I, I like it that way. And, Lord, teach us that lesson. Teach us that lesson, Lord, to just wait and to just pray and to pray and to pray and just wait and wait and wait and wait. Wait until you move. Lord, have your way in our hearts and our lives. We love you. We thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ. We thank you for this Bible. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Amen. How many of you remember when Jesus touched you? Say amen. Amen. I'll take your Bible, turn to Revelation 12. While you're turning there, um, Gary's been busy this week. And um, in fact, we've all been busy this week uh, getting, our, getting our packets out and uh, already receiving word from some people that uh, they're already receiving them and, and thankful to get them. We have a, a video that we put out last Sunday morning. Um, Rick Warren got in the news this week, and he is, he is probably the most influential man as far as what they would call Christianity, not just in America, but around the world. And uh, at one time, you guys know my testimony, at one time I almost fell for this guy and was going to follow him, was going to take this church. And some of you are saying, oh, no, you weren't. I appreciate you standing against me on it because I was wrong in what I was doing. Um, but anyway, um, he's trained hundreds of thousands of pastors and churches, maybe into the millions. People not even gone to his seminars, just following this man's, uh, I say ministry, it's not really that. He has come out this week, and um, he's trying to deny it now. He's, he's trying to back up a little bit. But he actually had, and listen to this now, he has a pastor in his church that is the director of interfaith outreach. And let me tell you what that is. That is a guy who is trying to make friends with lost people. Okay? And, and I say that not in a good way. I believe you ought to be, I think you ought to be a friend of sinners. Amen? But he's not leading them to Jesus. He's telling them that they are accepted the way they are. 
He's shrouding that, and it, it, probably if asked, he'll deny it. But that is precisely what he's doing, including, including him and a Muslim cleric getting along and getting together. And uh, this concept that we all worship the same God is coming out of this movement. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I do not worship Allah. I do not pray to Allah. I don't face Mecca. I don't read the Quran. Uh, it doesn't bother me in the least bit. Somebody burnt one of those books. It doesn't bother me. It's going to perish. It's going to vanish away anyway. Okay? Um, but anyway, we have a, a video, and Gary's put some out on the table, called The Biblical Case Against Rick Warren. Okay? This man is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Okay? Plain and simple. And the doctrines that he is teaching are damnable heresies, according to the Scriptures. And that's what I, all I do is go through the Scriptures based upon what he said and what he's endorsing. And uh, that's coming out. That's already been out. And then we got another one coming out on the Bible translation issue. And uh, it'll be out on the websites uh, today. And um, it will be, we'll have it on DVD here shortly. Um, whenever we take a stand for the Lord and whenever we take a stand for the Bible, the devil is not going to like it. He will not like it. And he will come after us. So just mark it down. Okay? Don't run. Don't try to hide. Okay? Just stand your ground. The Bible says he will flee from you. He cannot handle someone who will take a stand. <clears throat> and uh, this morning, I'm just, going to, uh, I'm just going to share some things that I, God has laid on my heart. God helps me uh, in studying and, and preparing for the messages and, and things to, to think about and pray about. And um, Gary had actually mentioned something uh, earlier in the week. That it just there was just a word that just caught my attention, and uh, I began to ponder that and began to pray about it and began to think about it, and then I began to search the scriptures. And when I was putting this sermon together, I had a direction that I wanted to go with it, and uh, as I searched the scriptures, God changed that direction. And uh, so I'm just going to I'm I'm just going to spend some time this morning just walking through and gleaning from the Word of God this morning. I don't have an agenda. I don't have an altar call in mind. I don't have anything like that. Um, but if, if you were to be honest before the Lord this morning, you don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to say amen. I'm just looking for you to be honest this morning. If you would be honest before the Lord this morning, do you need some help from the Lord this morning? Okay, if you were to just be dead honest, do you need some help from the Lord? Um, do you personally need some help from the Lord? Are, are you in trouble of some kind? Are you troubled about something? Is there something going on in your home, in your marriage? Is there troubling things there in your marriage that need help? Is um, all things, listen, and I'm going to get to some different areas of life, and you know how, how we do when we look at Scripture, let's just apply it to various parts of our life, and that is what we're going to do. But I want us to have some understanding this morning of, of why sometimes things go the way they go, and they don't always go our way. Amen? You don't always get your way. In fact, you probably sit in a row, I never get my way. Good for you. That's where God likes you. Amen? God likes it when you don't get your way most of the time. That's what he, Now you're somebody he can use. Amen? Is it be my way or no way? Now I want us to understand just the depths of what's going on in our life. Revelation chapter 12, are you there? Say amen. amen. Who in here believes the Bible? Amen. You really should. Okay, you really should. And when the Bible is in contradiction to what you hear in the world, don't listen to the world. Listen to the Word of God. It'll help you. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 12. Let's, read, let's start reading in verse 1 and we'll move our way down so you get the context of where I'm going with this thing. All right, we're going to go to verse 15. There appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun. I want you to think of the Bible typology language of a woman. Okay. She represents, uh, well, I've, she represents in the Bible a church. She represents uh, the kingdom of heaven. She is, she is heavenly Jerusalem. Jerusalem which is above and so on. But she'll, she'll represent a church. If you, I don't know if you noticed this last week or not. When I was uh, preaching about wisdom hath built her, her, her house, she had, she had carved out her seven pillars. The Bible refers to wisdom as a her. As a female, and if you look in the book of Proverbs, you'll see her 
all through the scriptures. Now, that has that has given rise to some false doctrine that people are saying, well, God is a woman too. God's a man, but God also is a woman too. be careful of that doctrine. Do not fall for that doctrine. Don't fall for it. God is not a woman. He never has been a woman. When we get it, when we get to heaven, we're not going to see God sitting up there in a dress and a pair of high heels and a purse in his hand. Amen. Okay. That wisdom is, is a woman is always representative of the kingdom of heaven or in, an, in the earthly realm, a church. I think a church ought to have wisdom. Amen. I thought you think it ought to impart wisdom. And by the way, this woman in Revelation 12, she got the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. 12 is number of God's promise. Now, I want you to notice in verse 2, and she being with child cr- cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. I want you to think about, uh, let's say, a family uh, where the woman is about ready to give birth. And uh, when a woman is about ready to give birth, those are not the joyous times of the marriage. Everybody say amen. That's some rough seas. Okay. It's only after the child is born that the joy comes in and you're, you're glad of that. And so but I want you to think about birthing as far as the church is concerned. I believe that churches are birthing stations. I believe the church itself is a woman. And I believe that we're to produce converts for the Lord Jesus Christ. People being saved is that child being born. Now, I know there's many different realms of this, and I'm just applying one scripturally. But when someone is born into the kingdom of someone is born again, that's that's the result of the evangelistic efforts and the preaching of the gospel of the local congregation. How many of you are with me on that? Say amen. So I think it's our responsibility to preach the gospel. To teach people about Jesus, teach people about the doctrines, and sow that seed of the Word of God so that there can be birthing taking place. Now, how many of you remember when you first got saved? The devil did not like it. He did not like it. Now, I'm going to show you this. So she's travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. In verse 3, there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great what? Red dragon. Does anybody know why he's red? Listen to this now. Red is in opposition to the color white in the Bible. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. In Revelation chapter 17, we have a woman who is riding a scarlet colored beast. That beast is the man of sin. Okay? And she is clothed in scarlet. Okay, she is clothed. You know what she is? She's the woman of sin. That is in direct opposition to the church being clothed, not in scarlet, but in what? Clothed in white. That means purity. That means uh, being sanctified. So anyway, behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman. Watch this now, which was ready to be delivered. Watch what the great red dragon is going to try to do. As soon as you got saved, he tried to devour you. And he's red. That means the full impact of sinfulness was targeted at you for getting saved. Look at this. She brought, uh, he was ready for to devour her child As soon as it was born. You see, he had you already in sin. But when you got born again, that's when he really turned on you and tried to go after you. And he's still doing it. How many of you know that? Say amen. He's still doing it. As long as the church will be a birthing station for the Lord, as long as the church will be evangelistic, as long as a church or let's say a family that represents the Lord, as long as they will keep preaching and standing for the word of God and doing what's right, they will always have an enemy trying to devour and trying to destroy. Now look in verse six and the woman. uh, Now, let's look at verse five. She brought forth the man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up into God and to his throne. That phrase caught up is the exact same words used in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. Somebody say amen to that. That means the devil, he tried to get us. But God wouldn't let him. He was, we were caught up. So now verse 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared for, of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. 
Now I want us to skip over to, uh, oh, let's see, verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. I could preach on that this morning. Verse 12, Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon, I want you to notice this now, and I want you to pay close attention now at verse 13, 14, and 15. When the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. Now, all throughout the church age, all throughout the time, even before the church, back in the Old Testament, God's people have always been persecuted. Now, we live in a country right now that, for, as, of, as of right now, 1130 Central Time, we can still preach the gospel in this country without having our heads shot off. I'm hearing that there is a, and I don't, somebody said that he's already dead, but somebody else came out and said, no, he's still alive. They're, they're having everybody pray for this pastor that's in Iran, a Christian pastor in Iran that has been on trial and he's been sentenced to death. For preaching the gospel in Iran. It is against the law to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in the nation of Iran. And he decided to do it anyway. And they've got him in prison. They've found him guilty of heresy against Islam. And more than likely, they're going to hang this guy for preaching the gospel. That's persecution. And mark it down. Mark it down. It may come to that here in this country. Already, already, uh, I've been watching this up in Canada. There's a, a, one of the uh, provinces up in Canada passed a law. Listen to this now. Passed a law or is trying to pass a law that says even if you homeschool your children, even if you homeschool your children, it will be against the law for you to teach them that alternative lifestyles are a sin. Already, that's just one step closer to them walking in this church and monitoring what we're saying. And if we say the wrong thing, we'll be arrested for it. Okay? Now, just you just hang on, because this is where we're headed. Okay? You just hang on, because this is where we're headed. And uh, I want to get mean with that, and God's kind of pulling, pulling the chain back, so I'm going to... But if you stand for the Lord, and you stand for people being saved, and you stand for the Bible, and you stand for the blood, and if you stand for marriage, and if you stand for raising children under the Lord, and if you stand, you take a stand on issues in your life, the devil will persecute you. And no, the, the, the United Nations... Troops are not going to come kick your door in and arrest you and have you shot. Maybe that's what some of you would like to happen anyway. The persecution is going to be a lot more closer and personal to you than, than what you think. He will come after you. And he will come after you where it's going to hurt you the most. And you listen to this preacher. He's, going to, he's not going to target your strength. He is going to target your weakness. So this morning, you just, you just start getting ready to feel a little bit uncomfortable this morning. Okay? You just get ready to start feeling a little bit uncomfortable this morning. Because we're going we're gonna to look at how he's going to go after you. Okay? And I'm going to show you how he's going to do it. He's going to persecute the woman which brought forth the man-child. And <clears throat> to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she may fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the face of the serpent... Now, don't you look at verse 15. The serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Now, I just pondered that this week and I've just had that in my mind this week. Gary likes to run in my office every now and then with his Bible in his hand. He's got his finger on a verse. And he'll read it to me, and he'll 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 start talking. Now he gets excited. And he can't talk, and it, it's just it's just kind of neat to, to see what God's showing him. But he mentioned something this week, and that it got that just hit me in my mind. Uh, I believe in prophecy, and I believe this Bible's right concerning the future. But we're living today 
And I'm telling you right now, the devil has opened his mouth and he has cast out of his mouth water against you to try to cause you to be carried away. He does not want you to think of think of anybody ever try to cross a creek that had a lot of water running down. it. You ever tried to cross one of those? You get about halfway. What happens? There you go. You know what you're doing? You're not standing anymore. And the devil will do anything in the world to get you to keep you from standing. Standing is something he, he cannot handle a Christian who will just stand their ground and say, you know what? I believe the King James Bible is the word of God. He cannot handle that. He cannot handle say, I believe in salvation by grace through faith and not by works. And I'm not backing down from that. And he cannot handle someone who is standing. I believe that I believe that marriage is to be between a man and woman. Cannot handle that. I believe that I believe that intercourse ought to be between a married man and a married woman to each other. Amen. That's that's what I that's what we stand for. OK. And but he's going to he's going to try to flood. Now he's going to try to flood your personal life. He's going to try to flood your home. He's going to try to flood our churches. He's already flooded our country. This country is not standing right now. We're falling. Get ready. It's not the same America that uh, uh, Opie Taylor grew up in. It's not the same America, people. It's a different world that we're living in right now because of the flood. And I'm going to kind of preach on those things in a little bit. All right, so just bear with me. I don't know if I'm going to get through all this or not, so I'm just going to start down the row and, and start moving on. By the way, do you believe the Bible say amen? I mean, this is prophecy and this, the Bible says it's going to go to happen. Now, I want you to watch this. Now, I want to show you something real neat. Okay? So he's, he put out, in verse 15, he, he cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Verse 16, by the way, how many of you believe in a universal flood that flooded every speck of dry land in this whole world? How many of you believe in that? Raise your hand. You need to. Now I'm going to tell you why. Did you ever ask yourself, well, you know, we know the water came up from the depths of the earth and water came down from the sky and all this and that and the other. And um, but did you ever ask yourself what happened to the water once it got there? What happened to the water? Where did it go? Anybody know? Did the government come in and scoop it all up and put it on the moon somewhere? Let me tell I want to show you from the Bible what happened. Look at verse 16. The earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Guess where the water went? It went the earth opened its mouth, and the water went down inside the earth. Now, I want to tell you something. I want you to just mark this down. In case you're sitting here or you're watching today, and to you the Bible is a good book, and it's got some good things in it, but you don't believe everything that it says. I'm going to help you out. I'm going to, I'm going to help you this morning and admonish you and correct you. If this Bible's not right about the past, don't count on it being right about the future. If, this, if there was not a universal flood that covered every square inch of dry ground on this whole planet, then this Bible is not right concerning the flood that is coming. And how then can it be right concerning the flood that is flooding your life right now? By the way, did God save people when the flood came? So think of, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. God knows how to save even when the flood comes. Can I get an amen out of somebody? And listen, if you, if you, you just believe the scripture, believe what it says, quit relying upon what, what uh, Dr. So-and-so uh, said. I heard him on the History Channel that geologists have concluded that the flood was limited to an area around the Ukraine and the Black Sea. Don't believe that garbage. Don't believe it. Believe what the Bible says. All right. So anyway, that's what happened. The earth opened her mouth and swallowed up all that water and helped the woman. So I just thought I'd throw that in there. Okay. Now, I want you to listen to this. I'm going to tell you where I'm going with this. All right. Think about think about issues right now in your personal life. Where the devil is trying to get at you for being saved. Okay? He's trying to get after you for being saved. He's going to punish you for being saved. And he's going to try to cause you 
to be carried away by the flood that he is sending forth. How many of you follow where I'm going so far? He's going to try to knock you down and bring you down so that you can't stand against him anymore. Think about, let's say, issues in your marriage. And everybody's got them. Everybody do this. Be that little chihuahua on the back of people's cars. Okay? You've got them. So think about, think about your home and the floods that have come in your home. Think about churches and the floods that have come in to try to sweep churches away. Think of our nation. Has there been a flood that has swept our nation away? Did you know in one place the Bible talks about how the floods have swept away the foundations? The foundations of America have been swept away. You know what the foundations of America was? People just believed the book. They just started believing the Bible. Okay? That was the, that was the, the, the flood of it. Let me just uh, kind of help you where I'm going with this. I'm going to turn to Jeremiah chapter 47 verse 2. I want to read this real fast. And uh, you just, you pray for me. I don't, uh, I don't think there's no way in the world I'm going to get through all this today. And, and I don't know what to do about it. But I just want to try to help you with some good principles. All right? So this may be episode one and next week may be episode two. Jeremiah chapter 47, verse 2. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, waters rise up out of the north, and shall be an overflowing flood, and shall overflow the land, and all that there is, there is therein in the city. Let me tell you about the north in the Bible. I love the language of the Bible. The north always indicates a spiritual place. Okay? If you read Ezekiel chapter 1, in fact, you know what? I would just feel better. Can I come down there? No, I mean, can I come down there and sit down? No, I'm just kidding. Okay? I just, I don't know, I just feel like coming down here. I just don't feel like being high and lifted up this morning. Amen? Let me tell you about the north in the Bible so you'll understand where this is coming from. The north is an area that indicates the spiritual realm. In Ezekiel chapter 1, the Bible said that Ezekiel was, Ezekiel was looking toward the north. And he saw, he saw the cherubs of God and he saw the, the sea, the firmament. And he saw the throne of God and it was coming up out of the north. The Bible all throughout the Old Testament will talk about, especially in the book of Jeremiah, where God is promising that there's going to be an invasion that's going to come down from the north. Now, I believe an invasion is coming upon America, but I don't think it's the Canadians. Amen? Unless it's at the hockey game or something like that. I don't think the Canadians are going to come and get us. I'm not too worried about them right now. All right? Sorry for you Canadians, okay? But anyway, I just don't think that. I think, I think there is an invasion coming from the north country, and I think that indicates the spiritual land that they're coming from. Okay? Um, there is, in the, in the stars of heaven, the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. There is the north star, and then there is a, a series of stars that surround it called Draco. You know what that means? It's the dragon. And he's always there on the north. He's on the sides of the north. And that's where he wants to reign from. He said, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. That's where he said he was coming from. Now, this is real interesting. I've taught this before, but I like this. In the tabernacle, you walk in the tabernacle. And on the left-hand side, as you walk in, this was south. And here you had the menorah. You had the, the seven candlesticks, which was the light. Okay, remember that the seven pillars of wisdom and all that stuff. That's what that has to do with. But on the north side was a table. I like this. Okay, on the north side was a table. And every day it had 12 hot, fresh baked loaves of bread. I like hot, fresh baked anything. Amen. Hot, fresh baked cookies, cakes. You name it, but hot, 12 fresh loaves of bread. And they were to be set out there every day. And that represented Jesus, the bread of life and all this stuff. And it was a table. And it, watch this now. And it was set on the north side. Psalm 23 said, Thou preparest the table before me. Where? In the, right in the presence of, of my enemies. Your enemies hate the fact that you're getting to sit at the table of God and eating that fresh baked bread. And they hate that, and they are going to come against you, and they're going, to, they're going to slide in out of the north. Let me move on. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 18. Let me get my scriptures out here. According to their deeds, according he will repay, fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, to the islands he will pay recompense. 
So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. Listen to this now. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the enemies of God and the enemies of you and the enemies of you and the enemies of your family, the enemies of your marriage, the enemies of, of your children, the enemies of, of our faith and everything like that, they're going to come against us as a flood. And I want you to think about it. a flood is not just a trickle of water somewhere. Floods are usually rapidly rising. Uh, you've heard stories about, you know, uh, rivers going, you know, you know, massive amounts of rain overnight. And I remember uh, several years ago, there was a campground in, in Missouri that was overtaken in the middle of the night. and People drowned because there was so much rain that night. The water rose so fast that it just overtook that campground and people literally died in their sleep. Because they had no warning that it was coming whatsoever. Floods of water. How many of you remember Tom Salk Reservoir? We woke up one morning and that reservoir had busted open. And all of that water came and it just carved its, it just carved its way down the land. And anything standing in its path was swept away. You cannot stand against the flood, by the way. You cannot. That's, and that's the purpose of the devil sending this stuff your way. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 46, verse 6. Let not the swift flee away, nor the mighty man escape. They shall stumble and fall toward the north by the river Euphrates. Who is, who is this that cometh up as a flood, whose waters are moved as the rivers? Egypt riseth up like a flood, and his waters are moved like the rivers. And he saith, I will go up and cover the earth, and I will destroy the city and the inhabitants thereof. Well, you know what? The city is your soul. The city is, is your soul and, and the dwelling place of God. The city is your home. It's your family. It, it, your, your family is a city of God. This church represents a city of God. God lives here. God dwells here. He reigns here. And we're all God's happy subjects in the house of God. Can I hear you say amen? That's what this represents. And Egypt is going to rise up. Egypt always represents the things of the world. Represents worldly lifestyles and worldly habits and sinful habits and everything like that. And those things will come in as a flood and the devil is going to open his mouth. The dragon's going to open his mouth and release this stuff out after you to try to destroy you. To try to destroy your name. To try to destroy your credibility. Here you are. You're going out trying to witness to everybody. Trying to hand out tracts and you're giving out videos or DVDs. Those of you watching on the internet, you're sending out emails and you're sending it off to people. And the devil comes after you and try to destroy you as a flood. Let me give you a real life illustration of this. And it's a prayer request that God just brought to my mind uh, of some, something that happened to somebody that I know. His name was Glenn. Glenn lived out in North Carolina. Glenn got in contact with me. I don't know, I remember how long ago it was. But he would always call me and he would encourage me. Brother, I'm praying for you, brother. Brother, I love you, brother. Mike, man, I'm with you. I keep doing what you're doing. And every time he would call, he would call and encourage me. And I would encourage him back right. I, Glenn, keep standing for the Lord now. Get, get your life right now. Every time he, we'd call each other, we'd just encourage one another in the Lord. Never met the man in my life. And then it went for a while and wasn't hearing from him, Jared. I, I thought, well, I wonder what happened to him. Kind of missed it. His brother called me and he said, is this Pastor Mike? And I said, yeah. And he said, uh, I'm, I'm Glenn's brother. And I said, yeah, I remember you. He said, I need to tell you something. I said, what? He said, um, he said, Glenn's daughter wanted me to call you. And he said, she said, have, have you talked to Pastor Mike? I said, no, none of these people have ever met me, but they just, they're, they're part of this. Okay. And he said, um, Glenn's in jail. And I said, what? He said, yeah, the FBI raided his house. They said he, he got into uh, prescription drugs. And they said they found thousands of them in his house. And he said it just went out of his mind. He said he's robbed three banks that they know of. They had actually had a picture of him on the news, you know, local news. And they said he's just, uh, and I, I asked specifically, can I mention this? And they said, yeah, it's, I mean, it's all over the news, you know, so yeah, go ahead. And they said, uh, he just, he, he admits that that's his picture. But he said he's been so out of his mind, he doesn't remember that he's done this. He said, now that he's been in jail, they put him in sort of like a medical ward to get him off all these prescriptions and things. that he said, it said thousands of them that he had. And, and they said there's bottles of wine and this and that. And you just don't mix that stuff. 
And um, so they said they got him. They got him pretty much dead to rights. And then um, the Secret Service got involved because they were going through his you know, computer stuff and they found pictures of Obama with the target on his head. And Obama's fixing to go to that area. And they just was checking it out in advance to make sure, you know. And uh, and I just I just sat there with my mouth open like this. And I said, well, here's what I want. You. I said, you're going to see Glenn. He said, yeah, I said, here's I want you to tell him I love him. And I said, tell him that. If, if they've got him, own up to it. Don't fight it. Own up to it. And whatever, God will be with you. I said, now, if they try to get him for something he didn't do, tell him stand his ground. And they said, you know, he is better and he's kind of lucid and everything. He's kind of back to the old guy. But and I said, tell him that I'm still his friend. And your friend, when you're real friends with somebody, you don't turn the back on them. I don't care how far off they get. You don't hear you say amen to that. Because one of these days, you're going to need it. One of these days, I might need it. Okay? We don't turn our backs on one another. You see, what happened was, here's a man that was trying to stand for the Bible. And the devil opened his mouth to cause him to be carried away. Here's a man that was passing out DVDs and all this stuff. And look what happened to him. The devil now has ruined this man's testimony to a lost world. It worked. Can he be saved? Absolutely. And I hope to see him in heaven one of these days. Okay? The new Glenn, not the old one. But I'm just saying to you, that's how he works. He'll go against you. He'll, go, he'll try to... You say you stand... How many of you, right now, raise your hand. I'm against sodomite marriage in this country. Raise your hand. Then the devil will go after your marriage. To make it look like a joke. You say, you were, you, you're standing against what now? You see how it works? Let me just get into the, some notes that I made. I just, I, what I did was I just started going through the scriptures. And I put the scriptures up here. And then I started looking at the scriptures and let the scriptures tell me what areas of life this applies to. Take your Bible, turn to the book of uh, Amos, if you would. Book of Amos, chapter 8. I may only be able to preach on a couple of these. So, number one, just make it simple. Number one, stand for the Lord. Number two, if you stand for the Lord, uh, you're going to try to reach out to people and people be saved. Number three, if you do those things, the devil will come out you with a flood. He will try to he will try to carry you away. He will open his mouth and there will just be a flood of your enemies that are rising up against you. Does everybody understand that so far? Okay, so I'm trying to make it simple. And uh, I, I mean, I'll be honest with you, I kind of struggled with Sunday school a little bit and got an email saying, man, that was man, that was great. That was right for me. But I'm telling you, it was a struggle. Sometimes my mind just won't. I just don't feel very smart. OK, and uh, it's just kind of hard to explain. But I guess that's probably the best way I should preach anyways. Not just preach, you know, let, you know, let God have his wisdom come out of my mouth. Somebody say amen. And some of you are going, well, Pastor Mike, that's what I hear anyway, you know, when you talk. So. You quit laughing at that, all right? Amos chapter 8, verse 8. You believe the Bible? Say amen. Shall not the land tremble? This is verse 8, Amos 8, 8. Shall not the land tremble for this, and every one mourn that dwelleth therein? And it shall rise up holy as a flood. I, you know what? I, I just started looking for floods and, and the promises and the warnings of floods in the Bible. I just love the King James Bible. It just makes your study for a sermon so easy. The only way to, the only way to get a sermon easier is download it from Rick Warren. Okay? But it'll, he'll charge you for it. I don't know if you know that. And he charges for it. This is free. And it shall be cast out and drowned as by the flood of Egypt. There's that flood of Egypt again. See, God's connected them together. It's your enemies coming against you. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon. And I will darken the earth in the clear day. Now look at verse 10. And I will turn your feasts into mourning. A feast, watch this now. A feast represents having plenty. Think of Thanksgiving. Amen. Thanksgiving, there's always more food, and we turn it into a contest, Joe. Who can clean all that off 
by the end of the day. Because when you have Thanksgiving, you don't just eat one meal. You eat that meal, go sit down for a while, get back up, get another plate, get some more. Okay? A feast represents plenty. A famine represents you don't have it anymore. You don't have that. It's gone. Uh, your feast turn in the morning and your songs in the lamentation. And I will bring sackcloth upon all loins. Sackcloth is not fine linen. Sackcloth is, you don't have enough money to buy decent clothes. You don't have enough money to buy this and buy that. You've heard, you've heard old timers talking about how they just sewed and stitched old things together just to have something to wear. You know why? Because they didn't have money to go out to, uh, I almost said famous bar. They've been out of business for years. Huh? Macy's? Thank you. Ask her how she knows where to go. I'll bring sackcloth upon all loins and baldness upon every head. See, it's a curse. Amen. Just kidding. Okay. And I will, ma- I will make it as the morning of an only son, and the end thereof is a bitter day. Behold the days of the Lord. Behold the days come, said the Lord. Look at this, that I will send a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread nor of thirst, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And I'm going to connect all this together. Uh, and this would be number one, and I'm just kind of minding the clock here. I, just, I would stand here and teach this all day long. Let's just have all day long church. And it probably wouldn't hurt to hurt us. Amen. Probably wouldn't hurt us to be to be just to spend a whole day in the house of God learning from the Bible. Okay, but we're we're not prepared for it today, so I'm going to let you out here in a little bit. But I want you to listen to this now, and I want to tell you some way the devil will knock your feet out from underneath you and destroy your witness and destroy your ability to lead souls to Jesus Christ, and it will be it will be in the area of your finances or the things that you have. Now, I believe in, in Bible Christians, we ought, not, we ought not be materialistic. Amen? We ought not be striving for silver and gold. We ought not, ought not be working for this and, and, and trying to get rich quick and hoarding and this and that and the other. Or just having a lust for the, the next new thing that's coming out, whether it's gold, silver, electronics, or this and that and the other. But you have to admit, that's how most of America lives. And the truth of it is, and I'm, I hear, I am not trying to beat anybody over the head. This is how the devil will affect us. And this is how he will destroy us. Let me just put it on the realm of churches right now. I want to tell you what's happened. Okay? These churches, a long time ago, started walking away from the Word of God. So what happened was, God sent a hot rod preacher in. The old preacher went away, or he, he died off, or he retired, or he just moved on, and they got him a new preacher in. And I'm, hearing, I'm still hearing this all over the place, Gary, from people saying, we got us a new pastor in, and our church is not fit to go to anymore. Okay? But here's what happened. The new preacher comes in. God sent that guy in there as a curse to that church. And he sent that guy in there. And here's, here's what Rick Warren, I mean, he says it. He delineates it in his in his books and his teachings, this is what you got to do, Jim. If you're going to have this big hip hop church and have a thousand people sitting in your congregation, here's what you got to do. You got to change all the hymn books, get them out, get them out of there. You got to change all the Bibles, get Bibles where everybody can understand what's you know there. In fact, just put them up on the screen and nobody have to carry. And nobody will have the disadvantage of carrying a Bible, lugging a Bible all the way to the house of God. And you do all that stuff, and then here's what you, you start talking big to them. You start talking about big dreams and big plans. Now we're going to change this county, change this city for the Lord. We're going to save everybody here. Uh, but we got to, everybody knows this building's old, it's decaying, and you know, it's got this cross up here and we don't like that. And so what we're going to do is we're going to change everything. We need a new building. Need a new building. In fact, it's, if we just had a new building that actually didn't look like a church, we would get massive amounts of people in. There'd be people swarming in. And by and large, and with some of these guys, it works. But here the devil now is leading that church into a trap. Because that church does not have the money that this pastor is throwing out there that they're going to need to build this new building. And he will get that that pastor, with that congregation's approval, will tie that church into a five to ten million dollar debt. And say, now we got got the land, we need to buy the land, oh we got to do this, and need to raise all this money and do all this. And he's going to have everybody in the church sign bonds and, and, and lock them into a five to ten million dollar debt. And, and try to get this new hip-hop building there with the coffee machines and everything like that. So everybody's cool now going to, going to the nice, cool church, the ones that we drive by and say, Boy, I wish our church looked like that. I don't anymore. Yeah. I want nothing to do. I used to lust after that stuff. And the book of Proverbs said, Lust not after her beauty. Yeah. I don't lust after that stuff anymore. They can have it. 
Because I know what kind of death they're in. And all of a sudden, now watch this now. The church runs into problems. It runs into problems. People leave the church. Tithing goes down. Now the church has got financial problems and they cannot pay the debt. You know what the church put up as collateral on the new church? The old church. And they've been swept away now. The, the dragon opened its mouth of financial distress and swept away that church. And now, listen, that church has got creditors all over town and does not have a solid witness of the Lord Jesus Christ anywhere that it's doing business. And neither do you. When you go out and get in debt and get in debt and get in debt and get in debt, well, I'd like to have that. Put the credit card out. Don't pay the bill at the end of the month. It's not a sin to have credit cards. It's not a sin to have credit cards. Pay the bill. Credit cards, credit cards. Sign this paper here. You can have it in 90 days and then it'll take five years and six years. You ever notice the price, the price of a vehicle? Has gone up, but now they, they've extended the time of the loan. Used to be you could get a three-year loan on a car. Who in here gets it? You don't get a three-year loan. You get a six- and seven-year loan on a car. It was a well that keeps the payments down. If you can pay it off for the next seven years. Again, don't. I'm not trying to hit, be mean to everybody. But I'm telling you that you're losing your credibility as a witness... As a Bible believer and everything else, when you've socked yourself into so much debt and you can't get out of it, you're losing it. And I'm going to preach on other things next week, so just get ready. But he will send in, and he's talking about, instead of a feast, now we're in the morning in lamentation. Instead of having nice clothes, we've got sackcloth. Instead of, instead of there being a feast, now there's a famine. And now we don't have anything. And the devil sent that in, opened his mouth, and flooded you with financial distress. Let me ask you a question. What is it that will cause personal distress on somebody more than just about anything? It's the fact that they can't pay their bills. And they're out of money and they don't know what they're going to do. What will cause problems in a marriage? What will cause? What is one of the chief things that will cause problems in a marriage? Can't pay the bills. We don't have any money. Can't do it. Can't, can't do it. Can't do it. And the devil, listen to this now, he will absolutely, who in here, in fact, I'm going to ask you, you know somebody, or maybe you have, been divorced over financial issues. Okay? It happens. And when the divorce happens, so does the credibility, even in your children's eyes. They see you sitting in church saying amen and praise God. and they're, they're, Your children are seeing you tithe, put money in the plate. And then they're seeing the financial distress that's happened to you. And they've heard on TV that, well, all you got to do is tithe and God will make you rich. And it's not working out. And it's going to cause them to doubt and disbelieve the Bible. Now, I'm not making this stuff up, people. This is reality. This is reality. And the flood of debt and the flood of financial worry and the flood of financial distresses and the flood of where it used to be feast and now it's now we don't have anything. And I will tell you something, somebody that's not really solid in the Lord Jesus Christ, that will carry them away. It will carry them away. Our grandfathers, Jared, they knew financial hard times. We don't. Mine and Jared's generation, we don't. We think we do. But we don't know it the way they knew it. And when they didn't have anything else, they just stuck with the old Bible. They just stuck with the word. By the way, let me, let me just give this to you. How is it that, someone, how is it that Noah got saved when the flood came? He got in the ark. God's always got an ark of safety. For you. If you'll get in it. If you'll get in it. But if not, the flood will carry you away. Am I preaching to you this morning? Okay. 
And I am not one that'll that'll. And somebody might question my motive. Oh, he's preaching money now. He's want more money in the church. You guys know me and know how I, how I am. That's not it. I'm concerned about you. And and your and your personal reputation, and your marriage, and I'm concerned about your welfare and how things turn out. And I know for a fact that financial things will bring you down quicker than just about anything. Can I hear an amen out of somebody? Okay. And so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to release you now. And I want you to ponder what, what has been brought forth so far. I've got several other things and I promise you they're going to be from the Bible. So all of you who've got all your bills paid and everything's all ship shape and you got a little money in the bank and you're going, yeah, amen, amen. Next week I got yours, all right? So all you people that... Oh, credit card bills, you can sit there next Sunday and go, Amen! Yeah, Amen! Yeah, no, listen. Not every, listen, not everybody's the same. There's some people in this church, and I love you, okay? You're so tight, when your eye blinks, your knuckles crack, okay? <laughs> that could be a good thing, it could be a bad thing, okay? And listen, I know some of you too. I know some of you, okay? Money goes out quick, but I, some of you, I know where it goes. It goes, you're just giving it to other people. Here, take this. Here, take this. Take this. That in itself is not a bad thing. Being Having a giving heart to people. Okay? But when it comes to either hoarding money, or when it comes to spending money that you don't have just to fulfill the lust of your eyes, you deserve the flood. You had it coming. And the devil thought, I got them now. They're weak. I know where their weakness is. And I think if I just flood them with debt, I'll get them. And inevitably, I don't know, how, I don't know why it works out this way, but inevitably when, when people are having financial problems, they quit coming to church. They just quit coming to church. They just give up and walk out and you don't see them again for a long time. Well, it happened. Well, they got some financial problems. Listen, if you're, having, if, you're, if you're having that kind of deal and the devil's flooding you, here's the ark. Get it. Stay in the ark. Amen. Because when it gets bad out in the world, I love it. What is it that destroys the sinner and saves the righteous? The flood. You think about it. You think about it. And by the way, this famine that's coming is a famine from hearing the words of God. The devil has successfully swept away with the flood, the foundation of the Bible in most areas in this country and in this world. Don't let him do it to you. I want us to, I want us, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you, dear God, for, uh, Lord, just, I, I, I'm hoping, dear God, that I'm preaching this right. Lord, I don't want to do anything malicious. I don't want to do anything, but Lord, I want to be a blessing. I want to be a help. God, there are just some really good principles that you have helped me with and still help me with, Lord, over the years. And Lord, I have not attained to perfection. I'm, a, I'm far, far, far away from it. But, Lord, as I examine the Scriptures and I see, Lord, what the, what the meanings of things are, I see things in my own life. And, Lord, because I've been pastor of these people for so many years, Lord, I just, I just know things about them. And I'm not, preach, I'm not using this against them. God, I'm using this to help them. And I just know, dear God, there's some people, Lord, that may be sitting here or maybe watching, Lord, out there that, that's, that you just, the, the devil has opened his mouth and has just flooded him with debt. Flooded him with financial misery. Flooded him with this and that and the other, Lord. And they just, and it's killing them. It's going to kill their marriage. It's going to, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt their testimony. And I'm just praying, dear God, Lord, that in the midst of the flood, or when they can see the flood coming, God, that you would do what you did with Noah and did with his family. Because, God, you are, in, you are in saving families. Lord, you saved Noah and his family. And, Lord, save these people this morning so the devil doesn't sweep them away. Thank you for the good word, Lord, that you shared with us, God. And help us, Lord. And, if, Lord, Father, if we've sinned, Lord, forgive us. And we repent before you this morning, God. Forgive our sins. Help us live right. We thank you, Lord, for this time. We pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said.
Amen. God, well, folks, Pastor Mike here. And sometimes you'll hear me talk about during a sermon or a teaching about being saved or salvation. And some people just don't know what that is. And I just want to share with you from the Bible what it means to be saved. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I'm not here as a pastor or here as part of this church because I'm better than anybody. I'm here because I'm a sinner. I have done things that have violated the laws of God. And uh, I need to be sorry for those. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. We all have what's coming to us as a result of our sinfulness and as a result of us breaking God's law. And some people say, well, you know, it says death. Yeah, we're all going to die. But that doesn't necessarily mean hell. The Bible also says the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. See, the Bible teaches and we teach here in a literal place called hell. We believe in a literal place of uh, joy and peace and eternal life that is in heaven that God gives to those that are saved. But we also believed in e eternal hell, a place of everlasting torment to those who reject God's gift of salvation. So we know that we have sinned. We know that the wages of that sin is death. But the Bible says in the same verse, Romans 6.23, But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever, including me and including you, would believe in Him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Being saved means being born again and being saved from the wrath of God's judgment upon us, what we deserve, what we have coming, as a result of our sinfulness. So the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I don't know about you, but one of the greatest things, in fact, the greatest thing that has ever happened to Mike Hoggard is the fact that I confessed my sins to God and God forgave and still does forgive every one of my sins. Romans 10 says it this way. It says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. What it means to be saved is that God has, has cornered you with the result and the things, the effects of your sin in your life. The Holy Spirit is bearing down on your soul right now and you feel the guilt of Almighty God upon you. And God is trying to make you so that you just like our parents used to do. God used to, is trying to make you sorry for your sins. We confess those sins to God. We repent of them, which means that we don't want sin to be a part of our life any longer. And we simply ask God, God, you take over the reins in my life and you be the Lord of my life. And you give me the promise of your Holy Spirit in me so that I know that when I die, I'm going to heaven now. And I want you to understand that God offers salvation to you today if you will accept His free gift. Trust in the Lord, repent of your sins. And the Bible says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you watch any of our videos or at some point and God is just dealing with you, you bow your head and you call upon the name of the Lord and ask God to forgive you and ask God to save you. And God promised in His Word, and God has never broken His Word, God promised in His Word that He would forgive you and that He would save you, and heaven would be your eternal home. I hope and pray that one of these days, I see you in heaven, and you get to see me in heaven. God bless you. Bye-bye.